Hey, our own Rabinowitz here for RedGiantTV.com. Recently, there have been a ton of really cool videos produced using trap code particular and trap code sound keys, such as this one called Silky Way, or this one called Let Yourself Feel. They use music to drive the creation of particles in a beautiful and artistic way. In this episode of Red Giant TV, Harry Frank is going to talk about music visualization, and he'll show you how you can do it with the trap code suite. Take it away, Harry. Hi folks, Harry Frank here, and today I'll be showing you some musical visualization ideas using trap code particular and trap code sound keys. This has been a popular topic lately, so I hope we have some fun with this. I'm going to start with one of my favorite pieces from Claude Debussy, and the piece I'll be creating was my visualization of this piece. Okay, first things first, let's drop the music into a new composition. And uh, I'm going to work with a 720 by 405, uh, 16 by 9 composition. So the first thing I want to do is create my keyframe data from the music. So I'm going to use trap code sound keys for this, which is an awesome visualization tool. So it's uh, under trap code, sound keys. And uh, in the audio layer settings, I'll set my music layer to be the audio layer input. And uh, I'm going to use all three ranges here. Let me troll open uh, ranges two and three. I'm going to make both of these active. And essentially what I want to do is make sort of a low, mid, and high set of ranges. And eventually what I'm going to do is have sort of the lower notes drive my position uh, a little bit. The mid-range notes will drive them even more, and then the higher notes will drive them even higher. So it's kind of like the, you know, the higher notes will push the position of the emitter higher in the air and the lower notes will push it, push it uh, a little bit less. So I'm just going to tweak these so that we've got uh, things in the right position here. So I've got some of the melody going on right here. I'm just going to kind of isolate that narrow little spot and then push this third range over. down here we have a little bit of a lower range going on. So um, from here we have to have sound keys write these keyframes. There's no way to make this sort of a live output that we can um, use with expressions or whatever. We actually have to go through and hit apply and what this is going to do is calculate the music, look at the ranges, and write keyframes to this sound keys layer that I've created. So it just takes a minute and uh, now we've got all three outputs, output one, two, and three, created with our three different ranges. Now next I'll just turn that off. We just need the keyframes. We don't need to see what's going on. In fact, let me save what I'm doing. And I'm going to create a placeholder solid. Let's make this uh, perhaps 50 by 50 pixels. And we just want to create our uh, position movement with this. So I'm going to do this with expressions because that's what you have to do with sound keys. You have to use some very basic expressions, nothing very complicated. We're just going to use some uh, addition, uh, subtraction, and a little bit of multiplication. So if I create a, an expression, the first thing I need to do are get all three values of these outputs from sound keys. So I'm just going to use variables A, B, and C. So let's pick whip. This first one, put a semicolon, I'll make B, output number two, and C is going to be output number three. I'm going to take all of these and, and add them together and assign them to a value of Y. These are just variables. Variables are just uh, letters or words that we can use to assign to calculations or otherwise very long sequences of uh, uh, code that reference a value. Now when I've used y here, again this is just an arbitrary variable, it doesn't really matter uh, that I've used y, but um, I've used it because it's going to be the y value. Next I'm using the word value. Value is equal to the position or the existing value of the uh, parameter that I've made the expression for. So in this case uh, value is equal to the original position. And then to that position I'm going to add this value here to the y value of my position. So essentially it's going to leave the value alone so I can freely move this around, um, but on top of that existing value it's going to push the y position up and down 
uh, along with the, the data of the sound keys. So th the way I need to do this is by taking into consideration the X and Y values. This is called an array. An array is a single value position or perhaps scale or rotation or anything like, or I should say orientation, anything that is a single value that contains multiple values. This is called an array. So when I want to add something to an array, I have to take both of those into consideration. Arrays are written inside brackets. So we always have a start and an ending bracket. My uh, X value, I don't want to change. So I'm just going to add zero to that. My Y value, I want to add this Y value right here, which is a compilation of all the, the uh, output values of the sound keys. So essentially I'm adding zero to the X and A, B, and C to the Y. Now what's going to happen though is when we add values because uh, zero is up here in the top left and we add values to that, uh, a positive direction is actually downward. So I need to go in here and set this to subtract. Um, well, like I said, I wanted to have output one, two, and three have sort of a different effect. I wanted two to have a greater value and three to have a greater value. So what I'm going to do is just multiply the values here. So I'm going to multiply output two by two, and I'm going to output output to three by three. So those higher values are going to result in a higher position. It's just sort of an alternate way of, of doing this. And uh, because like I said, I've added this to the position of it. I can actually modify it, even though there, there's an, an expression in there. So let's keep this down here towards the bottom. Maybe I'll set this uh, mid range to 1.5. So it's kind of working. Like I said, it's, it's a little bit of a well, there's a little bit of a fudge factor going on here because we're not really measuring pitch. We're only at measuring amplitude and I'm uh, just measuring amplitude in different places, but uh, but ultimately we're not really going to have this raise in Y value along with the pitch because we just don't have enough ranges in sound keys to do that. So I'm just kind of approximating it, but I think it works fairly well for what we're doing here. So now that I've got my expression created for my uh, placeholder here, I'm going to apply that to a light. It's just easier to see with, with a white solid, not as easy to see with a uh, After Effects light. So I'm going to go in here under new light. We'll call this emitter and uh, create that. Now it's going to give us a warning saying that there's nothing for this light to be uh, doing right now, which is just fine. So I'm going to copy and paste this expression into my light. And this will emit our particles. In fact, I can get rid of this placeholder now. And just like that solid, I can move this uh, light around as I need. So let's uh, create some particles here. So I'm gonna create a new solid. I'm gonna make several layers of particles. So this is gonna be a uh, particular one. This is gonna be kind of a smoky shape coming off of the uh, light emitter. And of course, let's make it the size of the composition. This will work a lot better. And uh, just for organization's sake, I'm going to make that black. So let's apply uh, trap code particular and set the emitter to be a light emitter. Because I've called this emitter, the light will now take over the position of where the particles are generated. Now, you can see we've got a long way to go. But uh, we've got the basic setup of uh, a light emitter and we've got particles going. That's a good place to start. Now, let's uh, go through and zero some things out. We don't want any velocity going. And I'm also going to zero out some of these things like velocity from motion, which sort of throws the direction uh, or throws particles in the direction of the emitter. And uh, I'm also going to set the velocity random down to zero. So we just have an emitter moving up and down and sort of leaving particles wherever uh, wherever it is. 
What I'm going to do to create the motion of this is actually go into the physics section under air and set the wind to carry the particles in a certain direction. Negative direction is going to carry them off to the left. Not very exciting. They look a little clunky right now. Um, so let's go in. I'm going to drop the size down. We'll say to uh, actually, let's break it down all the way to one. And uh, let's raise the particles per second count way up. I'm going to set this to 2000. So it's just kind of drawing them in midair. So here's where we get it uh, feeling nice and organic and uh, very flowing. We're going to go to the turbulence field section. And uh, let me drag this open so you can read this stuff. The turbulence field essentially is a fractal noise map in three dimensions. You can sort of think of it like a uh, fog. If you're walking through a fog and fog is a little denser in certain areas and less dense in other areas, um, fractal noise in three dimensions is kind of the same way. These denser areas or less dense areas are luminance maps that we can use to assign to things like particle size or position. So if we affect the particle position in three dimensions with this fractal map, in fact, if I set this all the way up to maybe 250, we're going to see quite a bit of displacement going on here. Okay, there's still a lot that we have to do, but it's kind of getting there and you can see where this is going. One thing I want to do is turn this evolution speed down. This is sort of the cycling of that map, the, the fractal noise map. Uh, with it set at 50, it makes it feel, I think, a little bit wobbly. If I turn this down, it feels a lot more smoky and organic. Now, one of the things we zeroed out at the beginning was this velocity from motion. I'm going to turn this up. So as my emitter moves in a certain direction, it's actually going to toss the particles in uh, the direction that it's moving. I set that to a pretty extreme value. Let me bring that down. So it's feeling fairly smoky and organic. And this is one of the things I kind of tell people, like when you're really looking to create something smoky feeling in particular, I don't really think that the trick is to go in and create sort of a you know cloudlet particle and make a big blob of smoke that just kind of shoots by the screen. Um, smoke has a lot of detail in it and uh, you're really going to have a lot more interesting results with a higher particle count and turbulence than you are with big chunky cloud particles. Um, now from here I also would like to do a little bit of tweaking to the octave scale and the octave multiplier. Now, if I were to explain these, um, it would actually take about 15 or 20 minutes, and uh, I'll spare you on this. If, if you want a better explanation, you can go to the uh, Trap Code uh, particular support, uh, or you can also check out my uh, Trap Code particular DVD. I don't want to make this into a commercial about it. I just want to uh, explain that I know for a fact that it takes quite a while to explain the uh, multiplier and scale. Ultimately, it's just one of those things you kind of play with to get the right results. I'm going to turn this fade in time a little bit higher. What this is, when we emit a particle, there's a certain amount of time that the particle will wait before it starts assuming the properties of the turbulence field. So in terms of its position being affected, it won't be affected by the turbulence, um, in this case, 0.65 seconds uh, after it is born. So basically it's sort of a, a time it tells the particle to wait before it starts moving around with the turbulence field. 
and I'm going to turn the velocity for motion up just a little bit more. Well, maybe I'll set that to about 30. Now, one thing to make you aware of, not that we need to change it, but uh, by default, particles are going to emit in a 50 by 50 by 50 area around the light. We actually have control over that uh, with this setting right here. So we can have a, a greater Z depth from that emitter or Y or X uh, depth. Now we're seeing the particles sort of die off as they hit the edge of the screen. I'm gonna push the particle life up to about six seconds. And uh, let's add a little bit of size random to these. And I'm gonna set the transfer mode to add and change the color to something just a little bit bluish. And I'll turn the opacity down so we get a little bit more of a smoky kind of feeling. Still feels like the uh, velocity for motion is probably a little bit too high. So I'll set that back down to 10 just to make these particles settle down just a little bit. They seem to be getting a little unruly. Now, depending on the look that you're going for, we could bump up the size of these just a little bit. Let me show you some alternates here. So if we turn up this size, maybe to about five or so, we go into the shading section turn on the shadow let, which adds just a little bit of a, uh, a shadow behind each particle. And we can go in the shadow let settings and turn that up just a little bit. Um, oh, maybe uh, three is a little bit better of a particle size. If we bump up the particles just a little bit and add some shading, we can get a little bit more of a, uh, it's kind of a fluid uh, behavior rather than the smoky feeling that we're having before sort of bubbles underwater kind of feeling. One other thing I want to do is go into the particle uh, size over life and have that sort of scale down after the life of the particle. Now overall, uh, because I'm driving this with an expression, I think this is really cool I can do this, I'm going to drop these values down a little bit more, maybe 1.2, and we'll, we'll try to for the time being, so that uh, we don't have such an extreme change in values here. So here, I'm gonna do a little mix of the two. I'm gonna leave this smoke the way we've got it, uh, with just a couple changes here. I'm gonna take the opacity uh, down quite a bit. I'm going to duplicate this. We'll call this particle smoke small and I'm going to make a set of uh, this with those smaller particles that I had before. Let's turn up the opacity and raise the particle count a little bit. So it's feeling kind of smoky and watery and bubbly and uh, I don't know has a nice kind of feel to it. But really, it's up to you. There's so many settings here and so many possibilities. I really think you should go through and explore your own looks and ideas with this. So I'm just kind of showing you the basic framework here. When I was going through and setting up this lesson, it, the choice of music and what the particles were doing sort of became an obvious pointer to me that uh, this would look really good sort of hovering over the water in kind of a, um, a lunar uh, ocean kind of scene. So um, that's what I wanted to kind of set up here. I'm going to add a little bit of a colorful uh, uh, head on the, uh, the set of particles here. So I'm going to make a set of particles that is our third set. 
we'll just call this the head here. And uh, we'll make this a very short in lifespan, about 0.5 seconds. Let's turn the size up. And uh, I don't know if we need shading on or not. That's kind of, uh, well, we'll figure that out. I want to set the color over the lifespan. So it's going to change colors over its lifespan. And um, I actually kind of like the look of uh, the uh, spectrum look. And uh, yeah, I'm actually going to turn off the, the shadow lit here. And let's turn down the opacity because we have these set to uh, add together. We have this blending mode set to add and uh, nudge this up just a little bit so we get a little bit more of a trail. Now to create an environment for this, like I said, I was sort of envisioning a, an ocean floor for this. And I really tried with um, Tsunami, it seemed like an obvious choice. Um, but I ultimately decided on doing this in trap code form. And I'll tell you why. Uh, it integrates with camera a lot better and it's also easier to uh, texture map. So trap code form is going to create a body of particles that have no emitter, but uh, rather than emit, have a birth, uh, life and death cycle, they simply are there. They're always there. And uh, we tell the whole body of particles what to do. So in this case, I want one single flat panel of particles. And so, oops, I need to create a camera for my compositions. So let's go up here, create a, let's say a 28 millimeter camera. And if I jump to the side view here, say we got three sets of particles and I go to my settings here, you can see that I've got three sets of particles in Z. So if I drop this down to one, we've got one flat panel of particles and I'm going to rotate this on its side. So let's go to the X rotation, flip this down 90 degrees and move the center down like that. Now I'm going to extend the size outward in X and Y. Remember that this is Y here. This will come back to, um, even though this is Z depth, I'm actually using uh, the Y size. So let's scale that out and then we can squeeze these together with more and more particles. Um, and how many particles you want is up to you, how much detail and how much patience you have for rendering. Now, uh, if you check out the Red Giant quick tips, I go into a quick tip of how to set up a quick draft switch to uh, sort of scale these down on, on the fly as needed. But uh, well, I'll just keep this with a simple set of particles, uh, let's say, uh, 600 by 300. Now the trick to making this look like uh, an ocean surface is to go into the fractal field. This is very, very similar in trap code particular to the uh, turbulence field. In fact, they almost could have the same name. It's the same idea, a sort of uh, fractal map in three dimensions, and it can affect the size of the position or the, the X, Y, Z displacement, um, as well as the um, opacity. In this case, I'm going to use X, Y, and Z linked displacement. And uh, I need a few more particles in Y. Let's, uh, well, let's just set this to 600 by 600. And uh, let's use about a displacement of 60. It's already looking like kind of a watery surface. If I go to the fractal sum here and set this to absolute noise, uh, it starts looking even more like uh, a watery surface. Again, what we're really lacking is the detail of squeezing these together to look at, make it look like uh, uh, a solid surface rather than a series of dots. Uh, but that is really where the, the rendering process slows down. So I'm gonna leave that for one of my last steps. So um, from here, I need to make a color map. So I'm gonna make a new composition and I'll call this, I should call this color map. And uh, let's make a new solid, go up to effect, Generate, I'm going to make a ramp here. That is a radial ramp. And uh, we'll make it sort of a blue, like a dark kind of watery blue to a very, very dark, almost black kind of blue. So over in my main composition, I need to drop this color map inside my composition. I turn that off and go into my form settings here go into my layer maps, which are external maps, 
go into the color and choose that color map to map uh, the RGB to the RGB values of my comp and map it over X and Y. So to create a uh, reflection with all this stuff in it, I need to make a copy of this project. So I'm just going to go to this uh, main composition here, duplicate it, and we'll call this the uh, reflection map. Now I'm going to open this up. I can get rid of uh, the color map and the form ocean, and I can probably get rid of most of these not sure if we'll need those in there or not. I'm just going to turn them off for now. But we do need the uh, the emitter and all that. Now, we don't want this up and down motion going on for a reflection map. So what I'm going to do is go into particular, go all the way to the bottom here, under World Transform, and transform my whole world 90 degrees. So that we can... Uh, just see it from that different perspective. In fact, I can offset this in Y. From this angle, you can also see that I've widened out that emitter size in Z quite a bit. Um, I'm just gonna fudge it and uh, bring that back in to about 25 for now. So this is my reflection map. I'm gonna drop this in and uh, use that in that color map. Now, to make this easier, I'm actually gonna split my comp view here. So I'm gonna click on my comp window to make it active, go up to new viewer, and uh, that's gonna lock this into this view right here. And I'm gonna drag this tab over, and split my views, and then I'm gonna open this color map up here and lock that one. So now, I can go into this reflection map and drop that in there, and we should see that apply to my form color map there. So let's uh, just give us a little bit more room to work with. Looks like I need to move this oh, the other way. And I also need to make sure it's scaled properly. Perhaps I need to scale the X in just a little bit and Y. We'll call that good for now. We can always go back and tweak. But now we've got sort of a re projected reflection in that surface. And if I wanted, I could actually go back into that layer, turn on some of these other layers here. And actually, I need to match the transform world settings here. So let's go into world transform, set this to 90, and match that offset value, which was 160. Oops was negative 160 in the Y. There it goes. So there we can see those uh, smoky particles having sort of a reflection in that surface. All right, let's nudge these all up just a little bit more, get a little more, more detail on that watery surface. And I'm going to go to this color map here and darken things up just a little bit more. Just bring this darker areas, a little closer together, and darken this blue up. There we go. And uh, actually, also in that color map, we can add a little bit of that moon sort of reflection uh, just by adding a simple solid, and I'll, let's mask that off. And uh, let's bring the opacity down. So it's just going to add sort of a white, reflective, uh, shiny streak down the surface uh, like it was sort of reflecting the moon. I'm going to bring the camera up just a little bit and sort of angle it downward. Okay, so uh, I can see I need to move that... Uh, reflection map over just a little bit. And uh, let's start adding some finishing touches here. I'm going to add a uh, star map in the background. Again, this is something that uh, form is really good at. So let's create uh, our form stars. I don't like this being white. I can set this to black. And uh, let's apply a trap code form and go into our base form settings and set this to a layered sphere. We'll set this to two layers. 
So it looks like that. I'm going to set these to be really large, like 3,000 by 3,000 by 3,000 sphere. Let's add more particles in X. And actually, we can have fewer particles in Y. We don't need that many. Go into the particle section, turn up the size, and turn up the size random. Now at this point, you're saying, well, it looks like a perfectly uh, grid-organized set of stars. But what we can do is go into the disperse and twist function and just disperse these particles randomly. Now disperse is not animated. So fortunately for us, um, it works in three dimensions, but uh, disperse is not going to randomly move unless we animate it over time or have something else control dispersion like uh, uh, audio reactor. But in this case, it's just going to have them well, disperse randomly, which is pretty cool. Now, right around that horizon line and the halfway point, if you'd like the particles to disappear um, from that halfway point below, we can go into the quick maps and map opacity and draw a map that kills the opacity of all the particles beyond that halfway point, or approximately from there. So again, we still have all of our uh, particles. So let's get into adding some finishing touches to this. Um, I'm going to add some shine using an adjustment layer. In fact, I like to name my adjustment layers. We'll make this shine using uh, drop coat shine. And I'm going to use a position from uh, 3D space. So what I'm going to do is create another reference layer, a little uh, light. It's not really going to do anything. It's just going to be a uh, a reference point of where the moon should be, which is kind of like up and out of out of uh, our line of sight here. And uh, we're going to use that position to drive the shine location. Now I covered this, uh, I've covered this a few times actually, um, but there's a Red Giant quick tip where I cover this in a lot more detail uh, about using shine and uh, referencing 3D position. But if you follow this uh, verbatim, it should work just fine for you. What we're going to do is create a source point expression. So Alt or Option click on the stopwatch there. Pick whip that 3D layer and type a period, lowercase to, uppercase C, OMP, so two comp, parentheses, start bracket, zero, zero, zero. So we're basically putting a three-dimensional zero uh, array inside parentheses uh, next to a function called two com. And essentially what this does is convert the equivalent 2D uh, location of a 3D layer. And uh, we can use that to assign a, uh, a two-dimensional source point. So if we added some movement to our camera, in fact, I'm going to do that right now. Let's just go through and add a little bit of wiggle to our camera. Uh, we'll just have it kind of wobble around a little bit. Um, so I'll just use a simple wiggle command, uh, one comma 12. So this will wiggle one time a second as far as 12 pixels in, in all directions of X, Y, and Z. Now let's go into our shine layer here, set the transfer mode to, let's say, add, and the colorize setting. I'll just set this to a single color, and we'll use kind of a warmer color like this, like something maybe a little bit orange or maybe blue. I don't know. We'll, we'll see how it feels. Eh, I'm going to go a little bit more of an aqua color. Let's go, go on that blue kind of feeling. And uh, I'd like to have my camera a little bit lower of a view. So on the shine layer, I'm going to go in and boost the light a little bit. And uh, more importantly, go into the shimmer settings and crank these up to add a little bit of uh, shimmer and interest to this. Now, one thing I did that I uh, thought looked really nice, or at least interesting, was use free, well, plugin, or it's actually a, a pixel bender script called uh, Omino Glass. And essentially what it is, is a chromatic aberration uh, effect. Now, before I, I let you preview it, I'm going to set up a couple things. Um, right now, I haven't set a background layer. So everything I've set, like the ocean and the particles and all that, has all been on top of transparency. So I haven't really had anything to create sort of a solid background. So I still have some um, transparency behind everything. So I'm going to create a black solid and put that 
way at the bottom below everything. I'm also going to create a map here. So I'm going to create a new comp and this will be my uh, map. God, cannot. I'm typing around my microphone, which sits right in front of my face. So it's kind of hard. So uh, create a black solid, create a white solid. Let's mask off this white solid to create kind of a uh, fuzzy oval map layer. And let's drop this in. We just need it as a map. We don't need it to be visible. Uh, let's turn that off. Go back to our Omino layer here and select this uh, map layer, Chromab map. If you want more information on this, uh, you can go to Omino.com. Just do a simple uh, search for that Omino glass and uh, you'll come up with this pixel bender filter. Um, so what it does is create some refraction and aberration. Now, the reason I find this interesting, oops, I need to make this in a, uh, an adjustment layer, is that um, as he states in his blog, chromatic aberration actually comes from uh, a lot of different light layers separating or different colors of light separating, not just RGB, which a lot of uh, chromatic aberration uh, simulations do. So if we uh, turn these up, you know, it's a bit extreme, but uh, let's, I'm going to leave it right around three. It makes this sort of dreamy feeling kind of look that I, uh, I thought was pretty cool. And on this shine here, this uh, uh, saturation is a little bit too high on this color. So let's turn that down and give a little bit more chromatic aberration to things. Uh, I'm just going to duplicate this uh, adjustment layer, and we'll also make another one for star glow. Anytime you've got water like this, I think star glow is a, a very welcome addition. So let's go in, go to trap code star glow, and uh, let's not be afraid to use something other than the default settings. So I'm going to go into this grassy star setting, which gives a nice sort of uh, greenish blue kind of setting. Take the streak length down as well as adjust the threshold upward. So it's a little bit more subtle, not uh, hitting us in the face. So I'm gonna take this final composition, go and do this, let's call this Claire de Lune Final, and add a little bit of color correction on this. I'm gonna use Magic Bullet Mojo. It's actually a really good tool for color correcting, or I shouldn't say correcting, but stylizing. Uh, motion graphics. It just gives it some nice punch, cooling, warming, whatever you need it to do. So let's let this render real quick. Here. So we could tone a few things down here. Um, turn down the mojo a little bit, maybe warm it up just a touch. Uh, bleach is going to take out some of the saturation. Maybe I'm going to warm up that shine just a little bit. So let's go to my shine layer, go to the color there. Let me push it down a little into a warmer color and go into the star glow and reduce the opacity of that layer. There we go. Now, one thing I didn't do, just to give this sort of uh, feeling of motion, was that in this form layer, in fact, let's uh, just do a temporary drop of this down to 100 by 100 pixels. and turn up the particle size. Again, this is just temporary so we can see it. So this is a very low resolution approximation of what our surface is doing. But what we can do in this fractal field is set some flow to move the displacement along. So if I set this to a very fast value, it's going to make these particles sort of feel like they're moving along but the reflection is staying put. So it's going to give the illusion that our camera is sort of drifting along the surface of this ocean. I think that's pretty good. So let's set our particle size back down to one and crank these back up to 25 by 2500. Jump to our final here and let's do a quick 10 second preview.
Thanks, Harry. As always, beautiful stuff. If you've enjoyed this tutorial, you should check out Harry's work at his website, graymachine.com. Harry is arguably one of the most knowledgeable people on the planet when it comes to trap code particles, and he has some great Red Giant Guru preset packs, like Video Rock, that utilize his serious chops. And if you're into presets, check out redgiantpeople.com where there are hundreds of free presets and templates for your Red Giant products, including trap code particular and magic bullet looks. Don't forget, you can always download a free trial of any of the Red Giant products that Harry used in this tutorial at redgiantsoftware.com. Once again, I'm Alan Rabinowitz for redgianttv.com. See you next time.